Welcome to Misquoting Jesus with Bart Ehrman, the only show where a six-time New York Times best-selling author and world-renowned Bible scholar uncovers the many fascinating, little-known facts about the New Testament, the historical Jesus, and the rise of Christianity. I'm your host, Megan Lewis. Let's begin. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Misquoting Jesus. You might think that as an agnostic who deconverted from born-again fundamentalism, Bart maybe doesn't see much value in his religious past. But was his born-again experience the thing that sent him along this incredibly successful career path? Did fundamentalism actually improve his life and make him an even better scholar than he would have otherwise been? Before we get to that, though, Bart, how are you doing? How is the world of research treating you? Oh, yeah. No, the world of research is going well. I'm... Um... Uh, I'm, I'm, um, I've been in London and for the last week I've actually like had nothing I had to do, which is so nice. And so I've been like, you know, reading books and things, which is very glorious. And so I, since I'm on leave this coming semester, I'm devoting myself a lot to doing this next book on, um, the ethics of Jesus that I've, um, I've called, I don't know if I've mentioned this on the podcast before, but in my head, I'm calling it. Uh, the origins of altruism, um, and uh, I, uh, I'm, you know, I'm. So for people who want to write in and say, yeah, actually, <laughs> evolutionary psychology has explained altruism. Yeah, so I know all that. So, but I'm, um, I'm going to be talking about how altruistic behavior entered into the Western conscience, uh, because uh, there was altruism, of course, throughout human history. Otherwise, we wouldn't be here as a species. <laughs> if we were all self-centered, we wouldn't have survived. But um, but my question is how, you know, how ethical discourse and how ethical actions changed with the coming of Christianity. And so I'm working on that now. And I'm, I'm going to be dealing with um, various issues uh, in that book. Uh, but one thing that I've gotten increasingly interested in is my uh, my recognition, my realization that the kinds of ethics that Jesus propounded himself got changed by his followers, some of them right after his death, and others over the course of decades and centuries, so that uh, in, a, in a variety of ways, but one thing is they came to be softened a bit. <laughs> and and I'm I'm uh, Jesus had a very rigorous ethic in many ways. So I'll be trying to show in the book, and it's pretty clear from just reading the New Testament, but that his his followers didn't sustain that kind of rigor. And one of my explanations is going to be is that Jesus um, Jesus had this apocalyptic vision that the kingdom of God was going to arrive very very soon, and people needed to be ready for it. And over time. After his death, after some decades and you know centuries passed, people realized, yeah, it actually is probably not going to come next Thursday, and it 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 ended up changing how radically they understood his ethics, so that instead of like sell everything and give to the poor, uh, they said, yeah, be generous, <laughs> and maybe not so, everything, everything, just <laughs> some things. No, already in the second century, you yeah, have these church fathers saying, look, he didn't mean it. <laughs> Because if he meant it, if he gave everything to the poor, then you wouldn't have anything. Then you'd be poor. <laughs> and not only that, but you didn't have anything to give to the poor anymore. And then you, you know, who's going to support the church if you give everything away? And so, is that, so they, you know, already in the second century, Clement of Alexandria actually has an entire sermon devoted to that. And so I'm, I'm interested in that kind of thing right now uh, for, for my book. So, yeah. Right. How, how are things on your end? Good. Good. I mentioned before we started recording, I have started a digital Hammurabi newsletter, which I am excited about, which is weird for me because the, the regular commitment of writing a newsletter is something that I've always felt very uncomfortable about because it means I have to actually sit down and carve out time to do a specific task, which I'm very bad at. But um, I think I found a way to do it that I will enjoy writing it mm. and including like, bits about what we're working on we're putting in a recommendation, Josh's book recommendation, because he goes through so much academic material uh, that he always has a, a book that he wants everybody to read. But then also things like a Sumerian proverb and an ancient piece of artwork that I think is particularly interesting and that people might like to know about. So, yeah, I've been well, sitting and great. writing those. Yeah, it's is this, fun. Is this a monthly thing or? Yeah, it will be a monthly thing. Yeah. Um, you know, the nice thing about... Um, what you do for digital human, digital uh, Hammurabi, and what we, you know, what I do with 
my books and my, and my blog, especially is, you know, if you're communicating with a general audience, you have to find the interesting stuff. And that means it's interesting for you too. Absolutely. <laughs> and so, yeah. so it's not like doing like hardcore research, really. It's, it is not easy and it's usually not fun. Uh, it just, it just is not fun, but uh, I mean, it is a kind of, because, you know, we're passionate about it, but it's not, yeah, but, but, but finding out what's really interesting about something then then getting it out there. That's yeah. Sharing with that's other a whole people. different thing. Yeah. 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 So, yeah, well, good. What, that sounds great. Yeah. yeah, no, it's, okay. it's, it's going well. I haven't sent any yet, but uh, who, who do I'm, they go I'm to? optimistic. Uh, we have a mailing list that people just sign up through our website if they're interested in kind of right. it, until now it's been mostly book releases, but I'd like to start making it more of a, a community type thing. Nice. Nice. Yeah. Okay. Go Hammurabi. Okay. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> now we should, we should talk about, about your life and your experiences, which is the topic of, of today's show. You've said here and elsewhere that you became a born again, fundamentalist Christian around 15. How did your teenage life change following that experience? Ah, right. Yes. Good. Uh, so, you know, I was kind of a typical teenager in high school. I mean, I, I liked, I liked sports and I, uh, had buddies and friends and girlfriends and, you know, I was kind of a typical guy and kind of, you know, partied on weekends. And, uh, so when I, when I got, when I was born again, that none of that really changed very much. Um, but over time, as I got more and more serious, uh, about my faith, you know, I just became more kind of traditionally religious. I'd never really read the Bible before, um, never had like group prayer before. And so I started getting involved with those things, but I I'd say it took a long time for it to have any kind of serious impact on my life. I mean, I continued, you know, I was on the debate team and working at that as on the tennis team and played baseball. I was like, I was doing all that kind of stuff. And, um, I think apart from kind of personal conversations I had and maybe inner feelings, uh, it didn't, it didn't change my life that much, uh, as a teenager. What had been your kind of, I, I hesitate to use the word academic for a 15 year old or, or <laughs> professional, but what had been your trajectory until that point? Were you planning already on academic studies or was it maybe an undergraduate degree and then we'll see what happens? No, there's no way anybody on the planet would have thought I'd become an academic. <laughs> like, I mean, you know, I was, I was reasonably smart, smart and I got good grades and for me, getting good grades was competition. I mean, everything I did was competition. It still is. It's kind of ridiculous, but I, like I'm, you know, and so getting a good grades for me, that was competitive. It's like, you know, winning a tennis match or something. And so, um, and so that's why I, I, I studied, I didn't study a lot really. I just, uh, uh, but there was no, nobody would have thought I'd become a scholar and it never, ever would have occurred to me. I had no idea what I was going to do with my life. I mean, my, my father was a businessman. My mom was a, a secretary. Um, and, um, I, uh, I thought I'd probably, I didn't know, go into business, you know, maybe I'd go into real estate, maybe selling insurance. I didn't know. I, I did, I had no, I didn't have a very big world. I, I was in uh, Lawrence, Kansas, which is a fantastic place, fantastic town, had about maybe 40,000 people there at the time. The University of Kansas is there. And so I knew a lot of university kids. And um, and so I probably don't have much of an excuse for not having a very big world, but I really didn't. And I, I couldn't really think about what I might want to do for, I tried to think what I'd do for a living. I had no idea. But being a scholar, like, yeah, that wouldn't have ever have occurred to me. So you went to Moody Bible Institute. Was this a direct result of your conversion to fundamentalism? Uh, yeah, <laughs> absolutely. And it was so what happened was, you know, the other thing that happened to me socially uh, as when I was still in high school is that in addition to my friends who played sports and my friends on the debate team and uh, in addition to that, I had kind of added this other group of people who were uh, more interested in religion and I were committed to Christianity. And so, you know, prayer groups and Bible studies and things. And, um, and I, as I got increasingly serious about it, I got to know the person who was the head of the local uh, Youth for Christ group, the Campus Life Youth for Christ group. And he was a winsome tw mid-20s probably guy who had gone to Moody Bible Institute. And as I got more involved with this Campus Life group, he, uh, he and I became close. And he, he convinced me that if I was going to be a serious Christian, 
Um, I wouldn't go, uh, you know, to Kansas University like most of my friends are doing. Uh, my debate friends are all going off to be debaters there. And, I, you know, I thought maybe I'd do that. Uh, but he convinced me if I really wanted to be a serious Christian, I needed to go to a Christian school. And as a graduate of Moody, uh, he thought that Moody was the best place in the world to go. And I had no clue. <laughs> I mean, how would I know? I knew nothing. I mean, uh, and so he took us on a tour, a few of us on a tour, a tour of uh, Christian colleges, um, like up in, you know, in the Midwest and stuff. And and uh, that was the one that um, he had gone to. And and he convinced me, look, this is hardcore. Uh, Moody Bible Institute's hardcore. It's not like, you know, kind of one of these kind of things where you take liberal arts and then get a little of Christianity on the side. I mean, this is like, this is Bible study and theology. And this is like really serious. So if you want to be a serious Christian, this is what you do. I'm like, well, okay. I want to be a serious Christian. <laughs> so, that's kind of the extent of my thought process. <laughs> <laughs> what was it like being a student there? Did it kind of live up to the expectations that he'd given you? I'll tell you. I mean, it's a weird thing about my life is I've loved just about every epoch. <laughs> I really liked going to Moody Bible Institute. I loved it. I was passionate about it. And um, I thought that... Um, you know, it was giving me just what I wanted. I mean, I hadn't in high school, you know, I would take classes that, you know, I thought I'd get a good grade in and I'd get a good grade in them, but I wasn't really kind of passionate about much of anything really academic, except for debate. I was hugely passionate about debate academically. And that ta that's what taught me how to do research is my commitment to debate because we were, we were pretty hardcore on debate. So I had the, the skills at this point, but I didn't have any topic I was interested in, but now I'm a born again Christian who thinks the Bible is the inerrant word of God. And I wanted to study this thing like crazy. And so at Moody, I, I would take courses in like, you know, the Gospel of John, first semester, Gospel of John, the entire semester, Gospel of John, or, or and another biblical book that semester. And then, of course, on like missionary act, missions, you know, or of course on evangelism, whatever. I mean, church history, there'd be these courses that are all related to Christianity. And since I was so gung-ho about Christianity, I threw myself into the work, uh, unlike anything I'd ever done before, except kind of to a minor exception debate. And um, I tell you, it just made a big, big difference in my life. Do you feel like it gave you a good grounding for your future studies? Well, yeah, in, in a number of ways. I mean, for one thing, um, because I was so passionate, I, I mean, at Moody, everybody's pretty passionate. You have to take classes on evangelism, you know, and on apologetics, how to defend the faith. And you have to you have to engage in some kind of ministry every semester. And so, like, I was a chaplain at Cook County Hospital in Chicago, uh, where, where Moody is. And I uh, one one of the things you ha everybody had to do is one of their semesters, they had to do door to door evangelism. And so they drive you out to some suburb of Chicago and you start banging on doors trying to convert people. I and, would not be good at that. Yeah, there are a lot of people who are shy who didn't like that, and a lot of us who were not shy who didn't really much like it, <laughs> but it's, you know, what we had to do. Uh, there was a semester when I was a, um, <laughs> as a counselor on the radio, uh, Moody Bible Radio, uh, where they play Christian music and have Christian shows and stuff, and people would call in for advice, Christian advice. I was like 19. And I was doing things like talking people out of suicide and stuff. It's like I had no training for this. It was completely, it was ridiculous in a way. But man, it sure introduced you to a different world from going out partying Saturday nights in high school. <laughs> Did it give you any experience in more academic research, or is is this more of a um, ah right? Yeah, that was the question, right? <laughs> experience. Oh no, yeah, I, I like so, the yeah. question you answered also. Uh, right. No, academically, it had it had a couple effects for me. One was the seriousness with which I took my academics. I said everybody was passionate, just about everybody was passionate about it at Moody, um, about being there. Um, but there weren't that many people who were academically driven. Most people um, were really interested in ministry of some kind, evangelical Christian ministry. The At that time, Moody Bible Institute only had a three-year diploma. And so you didn't get a, a bachelor's degree. If you wanted a bachelor's, you'd have to transfer credits and finish out at some other school. But um, so it was a three-year diploma, and a lot of people, that was going to be their higher education. Um, and they were training to be missionaries, or they were training to be pastors 
of evangelical churches where maybe you didn't even need a seminary degree, where they were training uh, a lot of people had different things. Women were not allowed to train to be pastors because it was very conservative evangelicals. I had a very close friend who wanted to take the preaching class and they wouldn't let her take it um, because, you know, women can't preach. <laughs> so, oh my God. So, so most people weren't like that, but I was into the academic side and I was just enthralled with biblical studies and theology and church history and, and academic topics. Um, and I studied like crazy because I just wanted to learn everything I could. And I would, I mean, it was really pretty crazy. I, um, I would pull an all nighter probably once a week or once every other week just to study. Um, and um, so I was really, yeah, I was really kind of hardcore into it. Not just for finals then, just generally. Well, not for finals. Ger and for, yeah, not just for finals, although, you know, I wanted to get the good grades. But, you know, I, I one of the things I did was um, we'd, con we'd become convinced, uh, my friends and I, about we, we were like, I had some friends who were kind of interesting, who like we, we were interested in like how to memorize things. And so we did like we learned all these mnemonic ways of learning things. And we wanted we wanted to figure out how we could get by on as little sleep as possible. So we'd have more time to do other things. And so the, we had all these formulae that we tried. You know, you sleep two hours a night and then take a 45 minute nap and you're fine. <laughs> you know, stuff like that. And so, but I used all this time for studying. But then also we thought I, I came to think that um, the mind, the brain is not something that is like a closed container that gets filled up. It's like a sponge that expands the more that's in it. And so I thought, you know, so I started memorizing books of the Bible um, and uh, word for word in, in English translation uh, so that I could recite them. Uh, and I, uh, uh, you know, because I, I wanted to do everything I could to learn as much as I could, man. So I just, yeah. So th that helped, <laughs> you know, it, it's like, it's like, you know, if you work out all the time, like physically work out, like if you're pressed, if you're pumping iron all the time, even if you don't have start out with a great build after a while, those muscles are going to develop and the brain, it's not a muscle, but it's like a muscle that if you use your brain, like really rigorously a lot, it changes and it changes you. So that when I was in high school, I was barely in the top 10% of my graduating class. I barely squeaked into the top 10%. Um, but, you know, I exercised my brain in a crazy way for three years. That was just the start. And already I started seeing the difference from friends at home who were at least as smart as me, but who weren't, hadn't been doing that. You must be a fantastic trivia partner. Uh, well, I'm I'm terrible at trivial pursuit because for some reason uh, I'm just not good at that kind of thing. But there there's this game. That I, I, I assume people will know what Trivial Pursuit was. Maybe not these days. But but there was a game that came out after Trivial Pursuit came out called uh, Bible Trivia, and it was done by fundamentalists. And uh, this this uh, this game was um, set up to test your knowledge of Bible trivia, and. Uh, yeah, I was pretty good at that. Uh, I there are only two people in the world who've beaten me in Bible trivia. <laughs> so I was pretty good. That's impressive. So yeah. we you you go through through Moody and then fast forward a little bit. You um, are at Princeton Theological Seminary. Did being a fundamentalist impact your experiences there? Were you the only fundamentalist, or were there were there others studying there? There was a transition period that explains what happened to me at Princeton, because as I said, you know, we couldn't get a bachelor's degree at, at Moody. So I decided to go to, to, you know, I, I wanted to keep going. I decided already at Moody that I wanted to be uh, a university professor. And so I was, I started Moody when I was 17 years old. And I, <laughs> my first semester, as I said, I had this class on the gospel of John. This guy teaching the gospel of John knows everything about the gospel of John. I thought, man, this is amazing. After about, after about a month or two, I said, you know, this guy's getting paid to do this. I want to do this. And so I decided- How do I that, get in on this? How, I mean, you know, to do, wow, this is how you spend your life? Wow. And, and so, but I decided early on that I didn't want to be um, one of these evangelical scholars who teaches at an evangelical school. So I didn't want to be a scholar among the evangelicals. I wanted to be an evangelical among the scholars. I wanted to teach in a secular university 
so that I could um, be an evangelical voice. Uh, and, you know, at the time, you know, I was completely ignorant. I kind of thought maybe, you know, I'd be able to convert students or something. I didn't know. I, I was pretty ignorant. But so so I went to, I, I wanted to, you know, obviously I was going to continue on. And after Moody, uh, for my bachelor's degree, I decided I wanted to go to Wheaton uh, College in Illinois, which is an evangelical uh, Christian school and a very fine school. Uh, and I majored, I was in the liberal arts there. I had enough Bible and theology, in my opinion, at the time. And so I majored in English. And I took all sorts of other classes. You know, I took, you know, liberal arts courses. I took, uh, you know, history and intellect, intellectual history. And, um, uh, you know, I'd, I'd take things like art, appreci art appreciation, music appreciation. I'd start learning about culture and uh, did a lot of English and a bit of philosophy. And, I, and so and I took Greek, you know, and so I started learning about classics. And I and so that was I, I wasn't planning on that on on that expanding my horizons. I was just planning to get a degree so I could, you know, at a good school, so I could get into a good graduate school. But it ended up making a huge difference when I went on then to to do further work as a graduate student. So Princeton was not so much of a culture shock having, you didn't go directly from Moody, obviously, into Princeton. You had this, a nice transition, which opens things up a little bit for you. So you were, it wasn't such a shock when you, when you got to Princeton. Right. Because, uh, so when I was taking all these classes of Wheaton, they're, they're being taught by evangelicals and my friends are evangelical, but it's not hardcore kind of fundamentalist like at, at Moody, like Moody was. Um, and people liked to think at Wheaton and to reason and to understand. And um, they, at the time, they advertised, I don't, I don't know if this is anywhere near true anymore, but at the time, they advertised that per capita, they were fourth in the country in the number of their graduates getting PhDs by percentage. So including, you know, Ivy Leagues, Harvard, Yale, and stuff. Uh, undergraduates, Wheaton was the fourth in terms of percentage. And so they, it, was, it was rigorous and it was interesting, but they were smart people teaching non-biblical subjects. And so that got me, that really started changing my perspective away from fundamentalism. I, I remained a very, very committed evangelical Christian. I was, I was a youth group, I was a youth pastor in a church for three years, my last year at Moody and two years at, uh, at Wheaton. And it was an evangelical uh, church in Chicago where I had a some youth groups that I ran and was really, really active in. And, but that did move me away from the fundamentalist thing. I think if I'd stayed in the fundamentalist circles, I would have probably gone to Dallas Theological Seminary um, rather than Princeton Theological Seminary. That was, uh, those were my two choices. Actually, I applied to both schools and I had to choose uh, between them. But I chose uh, Princeton because I wanted especially to work in uh, the analysis of Greek manuscripts of the New Testament. And the world expert in that taught at Princeton uh, Seminary, Bruce Metzger, and I wanted to study with him, and I got admitted there, and so so I went there, knowing full well that this is a theological seminary training Presbyterian ministers. I wasn't Presbyterian, um, never been in a Presbyterian church, knew nothing about it, but I knew it was it was what I considered at the time liberal, and I thought, you know, I'm gonna I'm gonna get qualified. Because I want to go on, I want to teach. I need to quiet, but I ain't going to listen to them when they talk theology because they don't know what they're talking about. <laughs> I'm going to go take advantage of the excellent education, and that's it. <laughs> yeah, and ignore what they say. <laughs> <laughs> and, you so know, Bible fundament... classes. I'm thinking, man, these Bible scholars, they, they, they don't know anything about the Bible. <laughs> <laughs> what do they know? <laughs> so fundamentalism kind of gives you the the impetus and the drive to go to. Um, to Moody, which exposes you to all of this educational um, information, and you get really into to research. And then you go to Moody, not Moody, Wheaton, sorry, mm -hmm. too yep. many colleges. Yep. Then we go to Wheaton. I wanted also to ask about your experience as a youth pastor, because Wheaton uh, gives you this, it broadens your horizons, it, it kind yeah, of moves yeah. you away from, from the fundamentalism yeah. a little bit. But as acting as a youth pastor, has that been a helpful experience? Has that informed how you now teach and lecture? Well, I'll tell you, it's made it made a huge difference uh, for me. I was I was a very committed evangelical through those years that I was even at Wheaton and at, as a youth pastor all three years. I still believed in converting people, and um, in, and helping them to commit to Christ. And um, and one of the things I did as a youth pastor 
uh, one of the main things I did was education. So I would teach Sunday school to high school kids. Um, but I would also, I also started running Bible studies and I'd have, you know, I have kids, 10, 20 kids come to a Bible study. And for, for the course of my life, this was hugely important because I had to figure out how to make stump, something that I was interested in from the kind of technical, biblical, scholarly kind of point, but, you know, fundamentalist scholarship, make that, make that interesting to, uh, you know, a 14 year old. How do you do that? And so, like, I do a Bible study on Philippians, and we do a four-week thing where I take one one chapter a week. And, man, I just had to figure out constantly, how do you make this interesting? You know, how do you keep a 14-year-old coming back and awake? <laughs> and so, and so easy. that started the entire process for me of trying to figure out how to make uh, difficult things simple and understandable and interesting. And... Um, so it, it changed my life really. And, uh, uh, yeah. So, yeah. So the youth pastor thing was good. It also convinced me I did not want to work in a church. <laughs> I did not want to become a pastor because I, it was a very good, it was a terrific church, a really great church, Trinity covenant church in, uh, Oakland, uh, Illinois. I loved it there. I loved the people there. We got along fantastically. It was great. Um, but I also saw what happens in the pastor's office with, crazy things that happen and the things that pastors have to deal with are unbelievable and the the amount of work they have to do you just can't you can't you wouldn't imagine you just think they get up and preach for an hour or you know for 20 minutes every hour. how hard's that right oh my god and the stuff the personal issues you've got to deal with in the church <laughs> so I, I i realized yeah i'm not gonna do this for a living yeah josh worked as an associate pastor for a couple of years and mm. some of the things that he helped people through some of the things that he had to do as a pastor. I, it's, it's really not just getting up and, and preaching. There is uh, there's a lot of uh, parishioner involvement in there. Well, there is. And it, and you know, parishioners are people. And so, you know, I'd be in the pastor's office who was a fantastic, uh, his name was Evan Gorenson. He was a fantastic human being and a terrific pastor and was not a fundamentalist at all. He was, he was a conservative Christian, but he was, wasn't at all fundamentalist, but I, you know, the phone would ring, he'd pick it up and talk for a few minutes. I'd get half the conversation. He'd hang up and explain it to me. And I'd be thinking, Oh my God, you gotta be kidding me. Really? <laughs> yeah. It's crazy and stuff. Not, absolutely not, not a career. I think I would uh, no. uh, want to do. So, do you think that you would have had the career that you, you do if you hadn't gone down this fundamentalist Christian pathway first? No, I don't think I would have. I've, if I had gone to college, if I'd gone to Kansas University, I would have probably tried to make the debate team and um, and probably just sloshed my way through an English major or something. And I don't know what would have happened. I don't know what would have happened. But my friends who all did that, you know, they didn't. Uh, I, I had I actually do have a couple of friends who were in who went into academics on so my debate. There were six of us in the final kind of debate team that that, that were like, like the final six. And we were uh, three of them became academics, um, but not in uh, not in liberal arts so much. Um, so uh, I don't know what I would I don't know what it would have happened to me. But no, the Bible thing set me off. And, it, you know, so I, I kind of geared up at Moody. And the the other advantage I had was not simply. Um, that I, you know, that I worked hard and developed, uh, developed academic interests, but also I became, I became really knowledgeable about the Bible. So when I went, to, when I went to, uh, we, when I went to, when I went to uh, Princeton Theological Seminary, it, it's training Presbyterian ministers, but the people who were there didn't go to Bible colleges and things. They're just men and women who went to colleges usually. They usually didn't major in religion. A few did, but they, they had other things, but they felt called to ministry. And so uh, they were at a real disadvantage when it came to someone like me and some of my friends at Princeton who had this training. Because so for one thing, at Princeton Seminary, all the Presbyterians had to take a thing, uh, had to take a Bible exam uh, that they had to study like crazy for. We, we, they, we called it the, the baby Bible exam because it's like it's basic stuff. And it's stuff, man, I had known for five years already, or three years, four years already. And they, man, they didn't know any of this stuff. And so they never did, you know? And so, but, you know, because ministry, as we said, isn't about ministry, is basically not about biblical exegesis per se, because it's not just about preaching a sermon once a week. There's a lot, a lot, a lot to it. 
Uh, but I had an advantage there. And um, as I as I got th- as I went through Princeton, you know, I developed a greater and greater interest in my Greek skills, which I and language skills generally. And so I, I started learning other languages. Um, I uh, I had to learn German because I wanted to do a PhD. And I, I took classes in German at Princeton University in the summer, kind of a crash, co- a crazy, crazy crash course. I uh, taught myself French, taught myself Latin, taught myself Coptic, you know, like I was doing that kind of thing. But uh, by that time, I had the intellectual interests. And at Princeton, then I started getting a sense of scholarship. And it took me a long time to get get like get into the the mode of actually doing historical scholarship rather than uh, fundamentalist having fundamentalist assumptions about the Bible. But that combination of my biblical training, my 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 hard work ethic and my uh, and my um, um, introduction to really serious biblical scholarship, all of that's made the most enormous difference. Had you had any interest in foreign languages or ancient languages as a high schooler or or a late, no. late teens? No, no, God, I was awful. And I got kicked out of my French class because I was a smart aleck and the teacher got fed up with me finally. And it's like I had no touch, t- I would no abilities in, in languages at all. And I, I'm still not, you know, I have friends who really are gifted linguistically or ph- philologians and, and uh, I'm, um, I'm not. <laughs> I mean, I, I work hard at it. I work hard at it, but it's because I love it, not because I'm particularly talented. I know that feeling. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So fundamentalism gave you the drive to study intensively, the forum to develop your skills as a communicator, and maybe the impetus to really delve deeply into biblical history and the biblical texts. Were there any downsides to your educational experiences as a fundamentalist? Yeah, <laughs> I'd say. I mean, I you know, at the time, as I said, you know, I lo- I've loved almost every epic. I loved going to Moody, and thought it was the greatest thing that ever happened. And then I went to Wheaton. I thought this is the best evangelical college, and this is a great. Went to Princeton Seminary. Like everybody else, who went to Princeton Seminary. I thought I was hot stuff because of Princeton Seminary. But I mean, you know. It's uh, Princeton Seminary is not the same school as Princeton University. It, it's they started out the same. In fact, Princeton University started out as a training place for pastors, but they had, they had split a long time ago. So they're across the street, basically, and you can take classes at both places. But it was, you know, it's not under the aegis of Princeton University, uh, but it's, a you know, it's a really, really good academic place. And so I was very, I was very, very pleased to be there as well. The problem that I so there are a lot of difficulties with my fundamentalist upbringing uh, and my Christian training. Uh, so I did, you know, three years at Moody. I did two years at Wheaton. Uh, Princeton Seminary, the Master's of Divinity degree, that you, that's, the, that's the training degree to be a minister. It was the only degree on offer at Princeton Seminary for college grads. Uh, and so I did that. That's a three-year degree. Uh, and then uh, I wanted to continue on working in Greek manuscript studies. And uh, so I stayed on, uh, I applied and got into the PhD program to work with Metzger, uh, who was a very, a very famous, justly famous uh, scholar. He, I think without doubt, the, the greatest textual scholar uh, in the country ever, and the great, you know, one of the two greatest in the world at the time. And so, so I, you know, I wanted to study with him and I did. So I, that was another four years. So altogether, I, my higher education was 12 years um, from high school. Uh, and in all those 12 years, I never set foot in a secular classroom. The first time I ever entered a secular higher education classroom was the day I started to teach at Rutgers University. <laughs> wow. <laughs> my first, and I, I t- it was really kind of interesting. For one thing, like just on the practical level, I didn't know how to start a class. Did you open because with prayer before? You open with prayer. Man, I bet you, you know, I ain't doing that well, here. We shouldn't do that at Rutgers. What do I do? <laughs> I have no idea how you start a class. <laughs> so I, 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 so like, I was just winging it. <laughs> so, and, uh, and so, but you know, that, that all turned out fine. But so one down, you know, one downside is that the, the big downside related to that is I am a very, very big uh, proponent of the humanities now of the liberal arts generally, 
and I had very, very bad education uh, in in the humanities. At Moody, we had classes on English, but if so, we could learn how to communicate the gospel better. We had classes in history, but they were history of the church. We had classes on theology, but not philosophy. We had classes in music, but it's like how to conduct the church choir, seriously. And so like I I I was so uneducated, except for my two years of Wheaton, which were valuable, but it wasn't enough. And so basically I'm self-taught in almost all the areas that I'm really interested in. Um I I learned to love learning. I learned to love reading. Taking my English classes taught me to love reading. But at the time at Wheaton, unlike now, I imagine, the emphasis was so much on reading and kind of aesthetic appreciation. It wasn't really on uh, literary criticism or literary theory or uh, cultural theory or anything like that. And so once again, you know, I, I, I learned a passion for it, but I didn't I didn't really get the tools even to do humanities research very much, except for history. I did get history and I got, you know, languages and I got classics. And so I got, so that part's good. But, you know, I, I really wish that I had had more training because my, my, I love classical music and it's all stuff. I just, you know, have to teach myself. I love uh, art. I love, you know, things like the impressionist, you know, I like, you know, whatever. I mean, Rubens and Raphael, and, but it's like, it's all self-taught. And so, um, yeah, so that's, that's a real downside uh, for me. I think everyone probably knows the answer to this, having listened to the conversation. But before we end, I just wanted to ask, do you feel like your experiences as a fundamentalist were overall a net positive in your life? I don't know how to answer that, actually, because I, when I left, when I left um, fundamentalist circles, I kind of, you know, I became an evangelical. Over time, I became an increasingly liberal evangelical. Probably through my master's program, my three-year master's program, I, I remained an evangelical and active in an evangelical church, but I really didn't like fundamentalist understandings of the faith. And then when I went to Princeton, I became a non-evangelical eventually, and then I eventually I left the faith after after my PhD. And I... I think as I moved into kind of more liberal evangelical circles, then into more liberal Christian circles, I had a real knee-jerk reaction against anything fundamentalist that I've had to fight most of my life um, because I realized just how um, how dangerous it, it was for me and how harmful it has been to so many people that I've seen hurt uh, by it. Um, people who are um, lesbian or gay, uh, women kind of in general. Um, there's a lot of, um, well, there are, there are a lot of perspectives that came with it that, uh, you know, people and people just with closed minds, people who just think the Bible, the, you know, the Bible's right. The world was created in six 24 hour days. And, you know, that doesn't, that seems kind of like an innocent thing to say. And you think, well, okay, it's dumb, but there's no harm in it. But uh, there actually is harm in it because you can't understand who we are if you, if you take the Bible literally like that. And it does lead to very, leads to very different ways of understanding the world and our place in it and to our social agenda, our political agenda. And I really, you know, and I really do regret not having a fuller education. On the other hand, if I'd had a regular liberal arts education, I wouldn't be doing what I do now. And I love what I do now. And so uh, I, um, so in a way, I can't fault at all my fundamentalist upbringing. You know, I wasn't raised that way, but my, you know, from the time I was born again at 15, I can't really fault it because, uh, you know, I really love what I'm doing now and I wouldn't be doing it otherwise. So that part's true. But, you know, and I, it's, I guess it's one of these things you just have to take the bad with the good uh, and the good with the bad. So, so it goes. I don't recommend it as a way to a path. <laughs> I don't recommend choosing your career when you're 17. <laughs> a lot of things I don't recommend. I don't recommend fun, fundamental sexual ethics, for example, <laughs> and fundamental understandings of women. I mean, there are all sorts of things I don't recommend uh, that I that I went through. And if I didn't go through it, I wouldn't be who I am. So, you know. What can I say? I wish I could answer the question. <laughs> well, thank you for the answer that you did give. That was very illuminating. We are going to take a quick ad break and then we'll be back with a weekly update. 
I'm pleased to announce that I'm going to be doing a new course called The Genius of Matthew, what scholars say about the first gospel. The course will be made up of eight lectures on February 3rd and 4th, so four lectures each day, and each day will end with a Q&A session. If you attend these lectures, you'll get the recording with some extra materials, such as bibliography and questions for further reflection, that you can keep for lifetime use. I'm very interested in this topic. <laughs> the Gospel of Matthew is one of the most popular books of the entire Bible and has been for a very long time. It is, in fact, today, the most frequently read book of the entire New Testament. And there's good reason. Matthew has some amazing material in it that's not found anywhere else. The Sermon on the Mount is found only in Matthew. And the Sermon on the Mount contains some of the most familiar teachings of Jesus that people have relished for centuries. The Beatitudes, blessed are the poor in spirit. The Antitheses, you've heard it said, you shall not commit adultery, but I say to you, the Lord's Prayer, our Father who's in heaven. The Golden Rule, do unto others. These passages and many others are really well known among Bible readers, but Matthew is widely misunderstood, and frankly, it's often underappreciated. Many people don't recognize the real genius that goes into this work, and in this course, I'm going to be trying to explain it based on what scholars have learned by decades and decades of modern study. Scholars have found things about this gospel that most people would not expect. We'll be dealing with some key questions in this course. For example, Matthew is widely thought to have used the Gospel of Mark as a source for many of its accounts. But why does Matthew change Mark so often? Didn't he like it the way it was? He adds a lot of material, he takes away some stories, and he alters things. Does he ever change things in ways that make his account contradictory to Mark's account? Why does Matthew include a genealogy of Jesus? a genealogical line into which Jesus himself is not born <laughs> because he's born of a virgin. Matthew frequently quotes the Old Testament to show that Jesus was the Messiah, but does he take these passages out of context and does he misunderstand them? Or is he simply following established procedures of Jewish interpretation? Jesus sure has some strict teachings in the Gospel of Matthew. He says the law of Moses indicates you should not kill anyone, but Jesus says, don't even get angry. The law says, don't commit adultery. Jesus says, don't even lust after somebody. Can he be serious? When Jesus does give his law, his law, in the Sermon on the Mount and elsewhere in Matthew, is he rejecting Moses? Is he saying that the law of Moses isn't good enough, that his followers don't have to keep the law? If so, why in some passages does Jesus tell his followers that they have to keep the law of Moses even better than the scribes and the Pharisees. What? Jesus' followers have to keep the Jewish law? Matthew's gospel is often called the most Jewish gospel of the New Testament. At the same time, many people point out that it's virulently anti-Jewish. Well, how can it be both? These are some of the many questions we'll be dealing with in the course. We'll be looking at who the author was, how this book got into the New Testament, and how scribes later changed it. Is it possible, for example, that the entire birth narrative, chapters 1 and 2, were a later addition? I've talked about some of these topics before, but never at the depth I'm going to be doing here, and most of the issues we'll be addressing in this course I've never lectured on publicly. The course, again, will be on February 3rd and 4th, eight lectures. The cost for coming will be $59.95. Those who come to these lectures will get the course for lifetime use. We do have an early bird discount. If you register for the course by January 28th, you'll be able to buy it for $49.95. I hope you do so. I'm looking forward to seeing you there. This is Bart's Weekly Update, where we get to catch up on all the latest about Dr. Ehrman's book releases, speaking engagements, ermanblog.org happenings and online course launches. So, but I would like to hear more about the course on Matthew that you have coming up uh, 3rd and 4th of February. Could you give us a teaser of one of the lectures? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's an interesting way to get to it. Uh, and so, um, so as I said, it's going to be eight lectures. 
and it's uh, and they'll each be on on a different topic. But what, one of the issues that everybody notices who studies uh, Matthew is it's it's kind of peculiar relationship to Judaism because uh, Matthew is this gospel that is um, often called the most Jewish of the gospels because Jesus Jesus is being presented as somebody who fulfills all the Jewish prophecies. Uh, he's the Jewish Messiah. He's sent from the Jewish God to the Jewish people to fulfill the Jewish law. And in Matthew, he tells his followers to follow the Jewish law, to follow it even better than the scribes and the Pharisees. And he never says things like, stop keeping kosher, you know, and uh, yeah, don't worry about keeping the Sabbath. He doesn't say things like that. Uh, he tells them to keep the law. In fact, to even keep it better than the Jewish leaders. And so it seems very Jewish, right? But then it's also thought of as one of the most anti-Jewish Gospels because, it, man, it, Jesus attacks Jews and seems to be attacking kinds of, you know, Judaism. I mean, so the most telling part is at the end when um, Jesus is on trial, uh, Pilate, this is only in Matthew, Pilate declares Jesus innocent and the crowd, the Jewish crowd, the entire Jewish crowd cries out that they want him crucified. And Pilate washes his hands, says, man, I'm innocent of this, this man's blood. And the crowd, it says, all the people, the entire people of the Jews cries out, his blood be upon us and our children. And so this, the Jewish people are taking responsibility for Jesus' death and passing the responsibility on to their descendants. This is the verse that was used for all these hateful purposes throughout the Middle Ages down to today, calling Jews Christ killers. That's Matthew. Well, if Matthew's pro-Jewish, why is he anti-Jewish? <laughs> and so, so this is a, it's one of the one of the mysteries of Matthew. And part of my one of my lectures is going to work be working out how Matthew pu pulls that together in a very interesting way. That sounds absolutely fascinating. Thank you for sharing. And for those who missed our announcements last week, this is The Genius of Matthew, What Scholars Say About the First Gospel. It's Bart's new course. It will be available from the 3rd and 4th of February. There are eight lectures. The price is $59.95 uh, as the, like, the full price. This includes live attendance to the lectures via Zoom. You can't like attend in person, but you can attend uh, online, um, Q&A participation, and then of course, lifetime access to the course. There is also early bird pricing available of $49.95. Uh, That's available through January 28th. And on top of that, you can use the code MJPODCAST for an additional discount. You can get um, more details and buy uh, access over at www.bartoman.com forward slash Matthew. And again, the early bird pricing does run out on January 28th. So probably just like pause the podcast now, pop over to the website, buy it, and then come back uh, while we do our uh, questions from listeners. Now it's time for questions from listeners, where Bart answers real questions submitted by Misquoting Jesus fans. If you'd like to submit a question for future segments, please visit bartermancom slash askbart. Bart, we have some fantastic listeners' questions this week. As always, I know I say that every single time, but it's always true. Question one, do you believe in, or did you believe in eternal conscious torment when you were a Christian? If you did, and looking back now, do you see any contradiction between eternal conscious torment and an eternally loving creator? Um, yeah, so in relationship to what we were talking about, when I was a fundamentalist at Moody, I absolutely believed in eternal conscious torment. Uh, that people who didn't believe in Jesus were going to go to hell and would be punished forever, horribly. Uh, and forever, forever, like not 20 trillion years, but, you know, forever. Um, that was one of the reasons I became so avidly concerned about evangelism, why I wanted to convert uh, my family, my friends, people I didn't know, because I was concerned for their eternal welfare, because I was sure that's what the Bible taught. Uh, and we had to wrestle with things. What about children who haven't accepted Christ yet? What about people who grew up in a context where, you know, they've never heard of Jesus, and, which is the vast majority of the human race? Do they all go to hell? Are they tormented? 
And many of my friends said, yes, I'm sorry, they do. And I probably said that myself for a while. Um, so, um, you know, and by, by the way, I, you know, I do have this book on, on this topic, Heaven and Hell, a history of the afterlife. So it's called Heaven and Hell. And it, it explains where these views came from, because I argue in the book that they're not in the Old Testament. They're not what Jesus taught. So where'd they come from? Did I, though, at the time, think that this was contradictory to the love of God, the idea that God is all loving? And I didn't think it was contradictory at the time. I thought that God was not only all loving, but he was also just. And his justice requires this penalty for people who don't accept Christ. And if somebody would say, well, is it just that God would torment forever somebody who's never even heard of Christ? Not somebody who's rejected him, but somebody who hasn't heard. I'd say, well, you know, I don't, I don't understand every all the ways of God, but it appears that is the case. <laughs> so, but today, you ask me, does that contradict the idea of a loving God? Yes, it does. Of course, it does. <laughs> uh, yeah. So, my my view has changed. In a previous episode, Bart mentioned that in one of the more recent biblical translations in Isaiah seven uh, seven fourteen, the word virgin was switched to young woman because it was more aligned to the original meaning of the Hebrew. But in an episode about Matthew, Bart then says that in the gospel, Jesus is born from a virgin to fulfill Isaiah 7.14. How did the writer of Matthew get virgin from his sources if the word should more accurately be translated as young woman? Right. So um, the deal is, is that Matthew is not reading the Hebrew form of uh, Isaiah. Matthew uh, probably doesn't know Hebrew. Uh, the original Hebrew says that a young woman has conceived and will bear a son. Matthew's not reading that. He's reading the Greek translation of the Old Testament that was used widely throughout the Jewish world at the time outside of Israel. And so uh, he, he's reading the Greek translation. The Greek translation translates the Hebrew word young woman as parthenos, which can also mean young woman, but uh, can also mean virgin young woman who's never had sex or any woman who's never had sex. And so uh, Matthew thinks that the word is Parthenos and he takes it to mean virgin. And so that's why he thinks Jesus fulfills it because Jesus was born of a woman who had never had sex. Thank you very much. Um, I recently read a book and the author submits that God is attributed as calling itself the Lord whose name is Jealous. Specifically, this person writes that Exodus 34, 14 should be translated as... For you shall worship no other gods, because the Lord, whose name is Jealous, is a jealous God. Is that an accurate translation, or is that subject to debate? Uh, I don't know, because I don't have a Hebrew Bible sitting in front of me. <laughs> Why not? I have, I'm afraid I'm I haven't memorized the verse in, in Hebrew. <laughs> so, uh, I, I, frankly, I don't know. It sounds a little bit odd to me. But, um, you know, a lot of things do sound odd to me that are right. So I don't, I, frankly, I, I'm sorry, I don't know. No, nope, apologies. I should have sent that to you ahead of time. No, no, that's um, fine. It's, uh, you know, we can, we, we can put it in Stump Bart and then I'll look it up. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> According to quote unquote common knowledge, Jesus was 33 years old when he died whereas most academics seem to agree on around 30. Is there any logic behind the exact age of 33, other than it being as many threes as possible? <laughs> yeah, well, and there's, you know, is there any logic behind saying around 30? That's <laughs> both are questions, uh, because why do scholars say that? And so I'll tell you why they say 33, and it's related to why scholars say 30. Um, neither logic is very compelling. Uh, the Gospel of Luke is our only gospel that gives us any indication of Jesus' age during his ministry. Uh, after uh, Jesus is baptized, Luke says that he was about 30 at the time. Luke does not indicate how long his ministry lasted. Either does uh, Mark or Matthew. Um, in Mark, and which was the source for Matthew and Luke, in Mark, the gospel begins with Jesus' baptism, and it appears that this is sometime uh, in the fall because the fields are ready to be harvested. Uh, and so it's in the fall. And then after that in Mark, everything happens very quickly. Uh, Mark's, one of Mark's favorite words is euthus in Greek, which means immediately. So paragraph after paragraph will begin, immediately Jesus did this, immediately he did that, immediately he did this other thing. And so it's bang, bang, bang kind of action. It ends at a Passover feast 
after all these immediate leaves, the Passover is in the spring. So it looks like in Mark that it's a matter of, of ministry going from the fall to the spring, so under under half a year. Um, so in that, if if Luke is right that he was thirty, then he would die when he was thirty or thirty one. Uh, but the Gospel of John, which does not mention his age, has Jesus ministering over the course of three different Passover feasts, because during his ministry there are three Pass different Passovers mentioned. Well. Passover is an annual feast. And so uh, it's got to be, if there are three of them, then uh, it's got to be over two years because if you, the first one would begin, then the middle and the end, you'd have two years. And people assume it's longer than that. They usually round it off to three years that the ministry is. So if he started at 30, according to Luke, uh, around 30, and he ministered for three years, according to John, then you get 33. Uh, and so that's that's just conflating those two accounts. Um, historically, I think it's impossible to say how old Jesus was. We say around 30 just for convenience, but we have no idea. Was he in his early 20s? When he, was he in his late 40s? Um, how would Luke know he was about 30? Luke is writing 65 years or so after Jesus' death. Who, who, who gave him his age? Uh, and so I, I think it's guesswork on the part of Luke, which means it's guesswork on the on our part as well. Thank you very much. One final question before we wrap up for the day. Since Bart is an atheist agnostic, does he embrace some evidence of an intelligent higher power that holds the universe together? Uh, yeah, good question. Um, as an agnostic, I say, look, I don't know. I mean, I don't know. I I don't think anybody knows, even though most people think they do know. <laughs> people will write me emails saying, oh, no, I know. <laughs> I, I don't know, and I don't think anyone else knows. Uh, do I embrace the idea? No. That's why I'm an atheist. In terms of my knowledge, I'm agnostic. I don't know. In terms of my belief, I'm atheist. I don't believe that there's any higher power in the universe. I think that everything that exists in our universe came about starting with the Big Bang. And you ask, well, what was before the Big Bang? You know, as one, uh, might have been Stephen Hawkins, I don't know, one, one, one physicist put it, it's like asking what's before the Big Bang. It doesn't make any sense because time literally begins with the Big Bang. So there's nothing before the Big Bang in terms of time. It's kind of like asking if you're on the North Pole, uh, how do you, uh, you know, what happens when you go north? <laughs> there is no north <laughs> if you're at the North Pole. And so there's nothing before the Big Bang. Well, how can something come out of nothing? Well, you know, physicists actually have explanations for that, but I'm just a simple scholar of the ancient ancient Christianity, so I don't know. But I don't believe that it's proof that there's a greater divine power in the universe. Uh, and so I personally think that it, the, this world is all, all there is uh, without a higher power. Thank you very much. An audience, as always, thank you so much for your questions. But before we finish for the week, would you mind just summarizing what we spoke about? Well, for me, this is an interesting episode because I don't think I've ever talked about this publicly before, that um, the, the upside of my having been a fundamentalist, um, going through a fundamentalist Bible college, Moody Bible Institute, and then an evangelical college, Wheaton, and only changing gradually over time. And was there any benefit to that? And I was pointing out that, you know, I wouldn't be who I am today without that. So it's a little bit hard for me to condemn it because it's it's made I have a great life and without that I wouldn't have this great life I'd have some other kind of life maybe it'd be great maybe not uh, on the other hand I do feel some kind of resentments about my education I think I was misled in many ways and I I wish I had had a better liberal arts education and sciences and everything else people normally study uh, so I have regrets but on the whole you know I'm glad I am who I am and without that background I wouldn't be here and so there are there are plus sides to it Audience, thank you so much for listening. I hope you enjoyed the show. If you did, please subscribe to make sure that you don't miss future episodes. Remember that you can use the code MJPODCAST for a discount on all of Bart's courses over at www.bartlerman.com. And that includes his upcoming course on uh, the Gospel of Matthew. Early bird pricing is good through January 28th and MJ Podcast will give you an additional discount. On top of that, you can access that at www.bartlerman.com forward slash Matthew. Misquoting Jesus will be back next week, but what are we talking about next time? 
Yeah. So next week we're dealing with an interesting topic that I think most people don't have the right answer to, including most scholar friends of mine. The question is, uh, has to do with the Apostle Paul before he converted to be a follower of Jesus, before he himself became a Christian. And the issue we're dealing with is, why did Paul hate Christians? <laughs> well, and people people think, well, it's kind of obvious, right? No, actually, it's not that obvious. And so uh, that's what we're that's what we're going to be dealing with. Uh, what led up to Paul's persecution, and probably get into a bit, but what does persecution actually entail? Thank you so much. Please join us then, and goodbye. This has been an episode of Misquoting Jesus with Bart Ehrman. We'll be back with a new episode next Tuesday, so please be sure to subscribe to our show for free on your favorite podcast listening app or on Bart Ehrman's YouTube channel so you don't miss out. From Bart Ehrman and myself, Megan Lewis, thank you for joining us.